Thanks for tuning in to this week's news recap. First headline, Bitcoin crosses 10K. After months of treading water, the price of Bitcoin surged past $10,000 earlier this week. Although it's not clear why, recent news has been bullish for crypto. For instance, the Office of the Controller of the Currency is now allowing U.S. banks to custody crypto, and the pandemic continues to have a dampening effect on the economy. Some industry analysts also believe that DeFi gains are being redirected toward Bitcoin. The impact was also felt on derivatives, as BACT and CME both saw record volumes in their Bitcoin futures markets. Crypto analytics firm SKU tweeted, CME Bitcoin futures had the most active session of the year yesterday. $1.3 billion notional traded. Open interest also climbed to a record high. On a side note, Coinbase Institutional published a report on the first half of 2020 that gives a good overview of the year in crypto so far. It said new people are purchasing Bitcoin and an increasing number of investors are treating it as a store of value. It also highlighted a number of positive metrics in areas as wide ranging as DeFi to stablecoins to derivatives to mining. For instance, Ethereum is up 73%. Stablecoins have more than doubled, and derivatives have also seen an increase with BTC options tripling. Next headline, an easy to understand Ethereum 2.0 primer. Ethereum 2.0 is coming and it's complicated. If you haven't fully wrapped your head around it yet, Coindesk published a detailed but accessible report on Ethereum 2.0 that includes everything from the definitions of terms like Serenity, Casper, and Shasper to explanations of why, at first, ETH created on Ethereum 2.0 cannot be sent back to the original chain. It breaks down what will happen in each phase of the transition. For instance, phase zero launches the beacon chain and proof of stake. Phase two introduces sharding. Phase, sorry, phase one. Phase two is for deploying dApps. And phase three, which is the least defined as of yet, will likely include more complex technological features, such as ones that increase privacy. There's also a deep dive into the economics of Ethereum 2.0, which may lead to the creation of digital assets that will be the tokenized versions of staked ETH and rewards earned by validators. Also, if you're wondering what Ethereum 2.0 will look like and want to hear it the way that a friend might explain it to you, check out Haseeb Qureshi's article in Bankless on DeFi and Ethereum 2.0. The Dragonfly Capital Partner writes, quote, Ethereum 2.0 is going to create a bunch of shards, which will work like loosely connected blockchains. But all the DeFi stuff will end up living on a single shard since it all wants to coagulate together. He further adds, that DeFi shard will be the place where the major DeFi protocols settle. Those that benefit from high velocity and being connected to large liquidity pools for liquidations, flash loans, or whatever. Maybe there will be one major financial shard, like London, or two city shards with their own specializations, like New York City and Chicago. I expect if there is a second city shard, it will be for centralized exchange settlement, separated from DeFi and all of its chaos. Next headline, what is the best way to upgrade Bitcoin? Governance in a protocol that takes decentralization as seriously as Bitcoin does is always a tricky subject. With the Taproot soft fork upgrade nearly ready, the Bitcoin community is pondering how best to activate the soft fork. If you're wondering what the main issues are, a recent BitMEX blog post breaks them down into, quote, one, should the minor threshold signaling period be followed by a flag day activation? Two, which parts of the activation logic, if any, should be included in Bitcoin Core? Three, should minor signaling eventually become mandatory? For the uninitiated, flag day activation refers to nodes and miners switching to a different code after a certain point in time, whereas threshold signaling essentially requires miners and nodes to signal support for a change. Bitmix created a decision tree that goes in order from least amount of centralized decision making to most. For instance, the least amount of centralization would be for there to be no flag day activation and also no activation logic included in Bitcoin Core. The most centralized would be to require a flag day activation, a flag day in the Bitcoin Core software, and also for minor signaling at the end of the period. 
The report recommends a compromise where Bitcoin Core follows the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal number 9, which includes, quote, a 95% minor threshold activation logic without a flag day and mandatory minor signaling, which is basically a Goldilocks version. Next headline. Why everyone keeps talking about YFI. In the world of DeFi, yield farmers seem to chase high interest rates from protocol to protocol, like lemmings, maybe not jumping off cliffs, but perhaps parkouring between them. I made that up, and if you don't like that joke, too bad. <laughs> but one new DeFi token stands a bit separate, YFI. As community member Ross Galloway put it in a recent YEARN.finance messaging board, quote, YFI is a mechanism to claim reward and yield farm tokens that are earned with the funds in YEARN's various and upcoming products. It may also capture some revenues of upcoming or current products as decided upon by the community through the governance process. At its core, YFI is the token of a collective yield farm that leverages unique elements of DeFi and Ethereum to capture yield for users of its products. For those of you who have been following this space for a while, to me, it seems similar to a DAO token if the DAO had survived. And we all know how excited the world was about the DAO, which raised $150 million in 2016. And that was quite the feat considering how low crypto prices were back then. On top of all this, YFI was distributed almost like Bitcoin in what the community perceives as a fair distribution in which no insiders or VCs or even the creator benefited. The token was released via the y.curve.fi pool in what Ross calls a continuous farmed offering. And he describes that as, quote, the newest, fairest crowd sale. Alex Saunders of Nugget News tweeted, quote, Over the weekend, YFI broke the record for the fastest coin to 100x. It jumped from $34 to $4,500 in seven days. However, it actually traded at $3 on Uniswap after YFI creator Andre Cronier released it, meaning I Earn Finance did 1,000x in a week. Next headline, WTH is YFII. <laughs> Chinese yield farmers, unhappy about the fact that YFI could only be earned through liquidity mining, forked YFI to create YFII, which has a larger issuance plus a halving mechanism. This may not seem like a big deal, but this spinoff became an example of the differences between the East and West com crypto communities, with the Western DeFi community calling it a scam and the Chinese DeFi community hailing it as the next big thing. YFII adoption exploded in China with crypto whales, traditional CFI businesses, exchanges, mining pools, and other entities adding it, while Western projects had a different reaction. Balancer quickly blacklisted the YFII slash die pool from its front end interface, which sparked a separate debate about whether Balancer was truly decentralized. The chief analyst at Token Insight, Minion Act ABCT, whose first name I don't know, so sorry about that, summed it up in this tweet thread. Quote, communities in the East are not super fussy about risks compared to the West. Some experienced ones are willing to gamble to chase the high yield, and some are putting a small amount of money just to try it out and experience the excitement on such high yields. And speaking of the East, China arrested 109 members allegedly behind the Plus Token project. Bitcoin's biggest Ponzi scheme ever with over $3 billion worth of crypto being scammed. So next we have a DeFi roundup because there is kind of a lot of activity in DeFi. So we're just going to do a quick run through some of these developments. First, with the explosion in DeFi, the number of contract calls to Ethereum hit an all-time high on July 25th with more than 3.1 million daily contract calls, the majority of them being attributed to DeFi, according to Coinmetrics. Next headline, or next bullet point, <laughs> MakerDAO became the first DeFi protocol to reach $1 billion in total value locked. However, Kyle Samani of Multicoin Capital tweeted that total volume locked or TVL is not a useful metric, at least for lending pools like Compound and Aave, since it subtracts demand from the main metric. Meanwhile, Synthetix replaced the Synthetix Foundation with three DAOs, one for protocol upgrades, 
one to fund public goods and synthetics, and one to manage and deploy funds to contributors. DeFi protocol Aave also went fully decentralized, transferring governance from the Aave core team to Aave token holders. Dharma integrated with Uniswap and enabled support for over 2,000 tokens on the Uniswap V2 platform. Betting platform Augur launched its version 2, which integrates DeFi features such as IPFS, the file storage system, 0x Mesh, DAI, and Uniswap's V2 Oracle network. And finally, FTX is launching a DEX called Serum on Solana. According to FTX CEO Sam Bankman fried Solana can process 10,000 times as much as Ethereum, and it's 1 million times cheaper. Time for fun bits! An adorable way to view live transactions. TXStreet.com is a very cute transaction visualizer, which represents Bitcoin, Ethereum, and or Bitcoin Cash as transactions, or sorry, the, the transactions on those networks as little people lining up to ride buses. Whenever a new transaction is broadcast on the network, a person appears to board a bus. They get to board the first bus if the transaction has a high enough fee, otherwise they have to wait their turn. All right, thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Dimitri and Ethereum, be sure to check out the links in the show notes of this episode. Don't forget, you can now watch video recordings of the show on the Unchained YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash C slash Unchained Podcast and subscribe today. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening.